There's nothing better than watching a bowling match and seeing Pete Webber get angry. Part of Pete's character wasn't that he was just prone to shouting at fans or photographers. Do not flash the camera in my approach. I'm telling you, don't do it. But it was also his extreme confidence and almost arrogance that was part of his success. Because you have to be just a little bit arrogant in the fact that you believe you are the best. Pete certainly felt that and it always seemed like he had a point to prove. In this video, we're going to look at a very motivated, determined and of course angry Pete Webber. This was during the 2004 US Open, a tournament that Pete had already had success in by this point, having won it twice previously. I wanted to break this tournament down because there's some interesting moments and the final match in particular is incredible. I just find it so fun to watch and there are some really impressive highlights in there too. Pete came in as the one seed, so before we see him in action, let's just do a very quick recap of the other matches just to see who would actually bowl against Pete for the title. I'm only going to briefly cover the main highlights, but I would definitely recommend watching the entire telecast as there's some really good matches in there. Match number one featured a very young Oscar Palerma who was around 20 years old at the time. This was his first PBA TV appearance and really this was the first time that two-handed bowling was introduced to the world. Oscar was bowling against Walter Ray Williams Jr. What I love about this match is that when we look at it now with the perspective of how two-handed bowling has exploded in popularity, we can see the clash of the two eras. The old school style in Walter Ray against the two-handed style that changed the game forever. It was a huge moment for Oscar and it looked like there were some nerves which is completely understandable. These nerves are multiplied tenfold when you're facing one of the greatest of all time and a player who has made the most TV appearances ever. Walter didn't do anything extraordinary by his standards in this match but his experience seemed to get him over the line. Match number two features Walter Ray against legend Brian Voss. Both players slugged it out in this one. There wasn't any miss from inside, so there were splits from both players, but when they hit their mark, they were carrying with ease. Brian Voss in particular got lined up and looked very good shooting a 260 game against Walter's 214. Now on to match three, and it's Voss versus Chris Barnes. Barnes at the time seemed to be making the TV finals for every major, but had yet to win one. There were definitely a lot less strikes in this one with both players getting a lot of over under reaction. There wasn't much to separate the players until Barnes made the first mistake in the fifth frame, chopping the 3-6-10. Voss nearly chopped a spare of his own but just grazed the three pin. Barnes then made his second mistake of the match and this one really cost him as he left the Greek church. This gave Voss a 20 pin lead and he jumped all over Barnes, throwing two more strikes to seal this match and move on to the title match. Now enter the man we've all been waiting to see, Pete Webber. Take a listen to this little pre-match interview with both players as it sums up Pete's attitude and demeanor nicely. I tell you what, uh, Pete and I are great friends, but when we step up here, we don't like each other and uh, you know that's just the way it is. All right, we'll look out for that. Pete, you have had to be patient throughout the week. You said that's been one of your keys. How have you been patient here so far waiting to bowl in the final? Uh, I haven't been done nothing real special. I just kind of watched them bowl a little bit, see where they were playing the lens, and got a little bit of a read. So, uh, like Brian said, we don't like each other right now. Let's get it on. All right. Dave, I'm out of here. Good idea, Holly. Pete got off to a very nice start with a double, and you can see that after just two frames, he's extremely fired up. If you look, you can see him bend down and pick something up. Well, that was actually one of his rings that flew off when he slapped his hand in celebration. Brian Voss was looking good too though with the first three strikes and Pete then threw two more for an opening four bagger. Now over to Brian in the fourth frame. Once again we can see there's just no hold room inside. If you get it either a little slow or just a pinch inside, the ball jumps and more often than not it was leaving splits. Voss had the 4-6-7 to deal with here. Match all even. Please. Oh! the four six seven out of the pit here it comes get out of there
certainly were the uh, the interall tire rock and roll. Brian Voss, who last night sent the crowd a fountain bull, had the 7-10 against Walter A. Williams Jr. That was unbelievable to watch. This conversion was just incredible to watch, and as the commentator mentioned, Voss had actually made the 7-10 the previous evening during the position round. Obviously, this pickup was huge and kept him right in the match. Now his next frame, and what happened next was almost unbelievable. Rounds, position play. Oh, oh, 7 oh, 10. Oh, oh. Can you believe it? Think I can get that? Oh my God. What are the odds? Brian, um, the odds are monumentally against this happening. He did it last night, remember? Astronomical. He made this last night position round. There's only been three of these ever made on television. Mark Roth, John Mazza, Jess Dayrook. The only three to ever convert to 710 on television. What do you think? Oh, no help there. Seven. Stays up for Brian Voss. As Brian said, what are the odds? And it must have been the commentator's curse as they were just talking about his 710 conversion from the previous evening. He couldn't make it this time around though. Now over to Pete, and now it's his turn to leave a split, so it's still anybody's match at this point. He follows this up with another shot that goes through the nose, this time leaving the 3-6, which he very nearly chopped. Brian then threw a great strike, but then not such a good shot on the left lane, and had the 3-10 to deal with after a very stubborn 10 pin wobbles, but refuses to fall. He just misses the three pin for an open frame and that now really does open the door for Pete. And Brian knows better than any of us that you can't give opportunities like that to somebody of Pete's caliber. A couple of more single pins from Voss means this one is starting to slip away quickly. Pete strikes in the ninth and now he needs just nine pins to win in the tenth frame. As far as this tough lane condition, anything can happen. Pete going to the spare ball, throw it straight and hard right down the middle. Nine, he's got it. He thinks he he's does. He's got it. He's got ten. He has got a major he championship. <laughs> right on, brother. Right on. Yeah. That's right. This is my tournament. My. Pete Weber is the 2004 U.S. Open champion. Seventh major title. First one's on me tonight. We can see he actually picked up his plastic ball and just threw it as hard as he could down the middle, which is a very risky move when you need nine pins. Normally, if a player needs six or less, then they will do this, but to need nine and to throw it this way was extremely surprising to me. I suppose his thinking was that the ball had continually been whipping in the inside part of the lane for both players, so if he did throw a bad shot, it would likely be inside and therefore it would be entirely possible he would have a nasty split to deal with. If he left a big four or a Greek church, suddenly nine pins becomes very difficult. But even so, I'm not sure many players would have been brave enough to do what Pete did. So as we heard Pete exclaim, this was his tournament, having now won it for a third time, and he brought his tour title record up to 31. Overall, it was a very impressive performance from a fired up yet extremely focused Pete Weber. He went out there and just got the job done. And the great thing about Pete saying that it was his tournament, well, he was actually extremely accurate because he didn't stop winning uh, the US Open. He would go on to win two more, which brought his total to five, which meant that he has, at the moment, won the most US Opens in PBA history. So it turns out that it really did become his tournament. And that's going to finish up the video for today. I'd just like to thank you all for watching this video. And as always, I'd love to hear from you in the comments. So please let me know in the comment section below which US Open win out of Pete's five uh, wins do you rank as the best? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. And as always, thank you bowling fans and see you all next time.